Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for being here this evening. I'm Joanna Yaz, Readings and Special Programs Manager at the NYU Creative Writing Program. It is my great pleasure to welcome you on behalf of the program and our director, Deborah Landau. It's an immense honor, as always, to be hosting the Rona Jaffe Foundation Writers Award Reading. This award was created by the celebrated and incredibly generous novelist Rona Jaffe to identify and support emerging women writers of exceptional promise in recognition of the special contributions women writers make to our, our culture. Amen. Over the past 26 years, the Writers Awards have helped many women build successful lives by offering encouragement and financial support at a critical time. The award acknowledges the difficulties some of the most talented writers have in finding time to write. Since the program began in 1995, the foundation has awarded grants to 164 outstanding writers for a total of more than $3 million. For a bit more information about the um, award and the 2020 award winners, who I'll be announcing in a moment, please see the foundation's um, website at ronajaffe.org, which I'll also be posting in the chat. Um, over the course of my career as an editor and a teacher, I've had the great pleasure of working with a number of extraordinary writers who've received this award, and I know how crucial it's been for them. The time and inspiration, and most importantly, the freedom that comes with financial support is an incredible gift. It's always so exciting to learn the names of the winners and then get to know their writing both here in our reading series and on the page when their work is published. Um, before announcing the winners, I'd like to take a moment to thank the wonderful Beth McCabe, who directs the award program for making this all possible. Um, and a couple of other notes again, I'm gonna keep you waiting before I announce the names of, of our terrific writers. If you would, I, you, you are all muted right now, please keep yourselves muted. I hate that word, um, but um, while the reading is happening, in case there's any extraneous noise, um, you, the chat is open in case you would like to shout out any of your friends and family or any of the writers in general um, during the reading. Um, when the reading is over, I will unmute everyone and give you all a chance to applaud and um, just a moment to maybe say hello to one of the writers or whatnot. And then also, each writer has their own reception room, which you are also welcome to join um, to say hello and celebrate them um, virtually after they've finished. Um, this is an amazing accomplishment. I'm so glad to see so many of you here joining us, I'm assuming from all over the world, um, to support these incredible writers. Um, without further ado, I'm going to say their names all at once, and then they're going to be reading in alphabetical order. Hannah Bay, Mari Christmas, Yalitza Ferreras, Tamim Proctor, Elisa Gonzalez, and Charlene McClure. And our first writer is Hannah Bay. Thank you so much for that introduction, Joanna. Um, I just wanted to note, I think that the chat is currently disabled, so just wanted to give a heads up. Um, but hi everyone, I'm Hannah. I, I'm so grateful to be with all of you today. Um, my heart is going crazy because this is such a tremendous honor and um, I'm, I feel so grateful to be part of this amazing cohort of talented, incredible writers. Uh, I'm a nonfiction writer. I am working on a memoir um, and I come to nonfiction writing through my previous career as a journalist who worked full time in newsrooms. Um, my memoir is a story about family estrangement and also cultural estrangement. For most of my youth growing up here in the U.S., I felt very much disconnected to my Korean heritage as the daughter of immigrants. And um, I endured a lot of, um, 
ups and downs in my youth. Uh, I'm a survivor of child abuse, and uh, which eventually led me to the decision to become estranged from my uh, biological family. But um, what I'm going to read for you tonight is very much a work in progress. So uh, please um, listen generously. <laughs> and um, it's part of a series of essays that I'm writing for Catapult. Um, this is a column that I'm doing um, that, while it might not directly uh, and end up in my memoir, it is helping me to explore a lot of the themes of understanding family history, um, South Korean history, and also um, my perception of, of these things uh, as a writer. So uh, here goes. Um, thank you so much. These days, when I want to see my father, I turn to stories. The ones in my head, the ones I'm starting to discover, and the ones he taught me to love, on the page and on the screen, back when we still had a relationship. Because I've been estranged from both of my parents for the better part of a decade now, I see stories as my only way of filling in the void that they've left in my life. Back when I still lived under my father's roof, before he could ever know the trajectory of my life and the separation to come between us, he wrote a clue for me, perhaps subconsciously, while helping me tell my life story for the first time. I was 13, thrilled that my seventh grade teacher had assigned us to write our own autobiographies chapter by chapter through a series of manageable homework assignments. This is the actual seventh grade autobiography. Um, it's called Inside the Brain of a Banana, starring and directed by Hannah Bay. Uh, chapter five, uh, chapter 35 was a parent letter in which I was to trust one of my parents to write a bit about how they saw me. Between Appa and Amma, there was only one obvious choice, my father. While I never saw my mother with a book in her hand, Appa was the one who brought me, without fail, on his weekly visits to the public library. Together, we piled up crinkly stacks of plastic sheathed library books and clamshell cases of classic films on VHS. We brought them home and we searched for meaning. He would turn to theological texts to compose his Sunday sermons over his electric typewriter. I devoured tales of bold, independent girls. Girls like Pippi Longstocking, then later Scout Finch, that inspired me to bang out my own stories of adventure on the sticky manual typewriter that Appa once salvaged for me from a Salvation Army. For his chapter in my middle school autobiography, Appa typed out just half a page about me, his defiantly assimilated American-born daughter. I wish she would learn more about Korean customs, culture, and etiquette, he wrote. If she learns about Korean history and culture, she can understand her parents more. And she can have more experience in different cultures. He left it there. Upon reading his words, I shrugged his wishes away in my own adolescent disinterest. Appa never did teach me about Korean history or his own roots. But decades later, Long after I'd forgotten about my seventh grade project and what my father wrote, I would go on to seek out those stories on my own, not fully aware that I was living out his express wish. I want to go back, a middle-aged Korean man howls, staring directly into the camera early in the 1999 film, Peppermint Candy. In these desperate words, I hear a version of my father's hope for me. I want you to go back. In our estrangement, I feel closest to Appa now when I return, be it physically or mentally, to South Korea, 
especially his hometown of Guangzhou. For most of my 20s, when I lived and worked in Seoul as a journalist, that return was corporeal, immersive. These days, in my mid-30s, as a global pandemic puts my biennial visits to Korea on hold, my return to our roots comes in the form of narratives that I wade through while I try to tell my life story once again. I found Peppermint Candy, a South Korean film, a few years ago while exploring narratives set in Gwangju. During the years that I spent in Seoul, I learned that Gwangju is a city whose name in contemporary South Korea is practically shorthand for a large-scale pro-democracy movement that ended in the military's brutal massacre on civilians in May of 1980. Written and directed by Yi Chang-dong, who's perhaps best known for his recent film Burning here in the US, Peppermint Candy tells the story of Young Ho, a man of my father's generation in reverse chronological order. As the film unfolds, taking us further back, scene by scene through Young Ho's life, E reveals how one man's history, including his seminal trauma, continues to reverberate. To be clear, while they would be of similar age, Young Ho's fictional life diverges dramatically from my father's real life experience, which remains to me in many ways shrouded in the unknown. Where their stories intersect in Gwangju, my father is one of the city's native sons, while Young Ho, an outsider from Seoul, is one of the soldiers sent to suppress the citizens' uprising in 1980. But Young Ho is a reluctant soldier, ill-suited to South Korea's mandatory military service, and the E script makes it clear that the Gwangju uprising becomes the character's first distressing brush with death. Peppermint Candy depicts just one random, startling moment of violence during the 1980 Gwangju uprising, when Yong Ho accidentally kills a schoolgirl, when he intended to let her pass safely. But history tells me of the uprising's brutal toll on a far larger scale. Some estimates put the death count near 2,000. In Yong Ho's world, his guilt over one senseless death ripples through every other scene for the rest of his life. The film leaves me to imagine how the uprising as a whole would have devastated the city of Gwangju and the lives of its citizens, including my father. The art of nonfiction requires writing into the questions that grow into obsessions. For me, so many questions persist about my parents and their lives before they immigrated to the United States. These stories long papered over by their silence, then pulled completely from my reach by our severed family ties. But the more I learn about Korea, its history and its culture, the more I uncover clues about why my parents remained so reticent all those years ago. Thank you so much. That's all I have written for now, but um, hopefully you'll be able to see the full essay uh, in the next month, let's, let's hope. Uh, but thank you, it's such a privilege. Thank you so much, Hannah. Our next reader is Mari Christmas. Hi, Hannah, that was so great. Um, I'm really thrilled to be here alongside such incredible writers. And um, thank you, Beth and Joanna, for creating this celebratory space in such an unprecedented time. Um, it's been really special to get to know everyone and uh, to be able to celebrate like this. Uh, and to the Rona Jaffe Foundation for giving me and others the opportunity for our art to flourish. Uh, I'll be reading from my manuscript in progress tonight. Uh, the title is called Fugue States. I'll be reading close to the beginning or the beginning since it's sort of in progress. Um, so there's not much that you need to know ahead of time. Um, so I'll just jump right in. All right. It was the middle of December when I arrived, another beaten in winter, and I was down and out and about four months pregnant. I had left the city without telling anyone. It was 2008. The nation was in the midst of a wandering war, and when I left the city, all I could say of it was this. 
It was the year the New Yorker featured fiction with a lot of women in repose and sleeping. While I couldn't do much of it, the dream that I could have been anyone no longer held my attention, as did the idea of starting over, even with all these new cells in my body waiting to be flung forward. My life had a way of closing in around me, and I had just wanted to look out my window, past the strangers, and not see anybody, which was another way of remembering who I was. When I turned to look back at the city shrinking behind me like a hard point, I saw that it had always held its shape and that this had been the problem with me. I had grown up in a different city, a smaller one, also in the Northeast, and just as deliberate and noisy. My sister still lived there. It had been years since we last spoke, but it all washed off in the night and I would awake startled and thinking about her. When my sister and I were younger, the idea that we could move beyond ourselves fascinated us in the same way it appealed to anyone young and did not yet know the self. We refused to believe in the simple truth that you are who you will be for the rest of your life. Instead, we read books that blinded us to all of that, it was just an idea we had gotten into our heads and nothing could disabuse us of it. Perhaps we wanted a more interesting view of the world. Our surroundings, the details of our discontent provided no great comfort or inspiration, no similes or expressions of feeling that could transform our dim one bedroom of apartment into something it was not. And I was left with a stinging insight that I was ashamed of the way I saw the world, that I saw things the way everyone else saw them, saw themselves. We were just a world under the sky, under a sun that was always burning. So I was reading to outlive my life, to outlive the fact that I was not exceptional at all. I had left the city in this condition, had fallen asleep on the bus atop my coat, and had awoken at the border. If I had a passport, I would have kept going. It was dark outside. If it was cold, I don't remember. When I saw that there was nothing past the gate, I laid back down, confused by its lack of finality. I had resigned myself to all of this. The border looked like any other toll booth. Still, I wanted to stay there forever, breathing lungfuls of that healthy Canadian air and letting my life be eaten away by sleep. A guard approached saying some words. I couldn't pay him any attention. He was a domestic grunt. You have to choose a side, this or that, I suppose he said. On or off, he said. They don't let you linger on the border. I looked outside, the world suddenly no longer at my heels but he was unyielding. Miss, miss, he said. Then he paused as if searching for something less formal. Had I listened more carefully, I would have heard a touch of sadness there, perhaps some pleading, but I wasn't listening. I felt I could stand the waiting. Most of my life was already happening, had already happened. I always felt this way, and I expected to continue piecing the world together whenever I wanted, numb to all its familiar patterns. I must have been carried out because there I was, suddenly no longer prostrate on the back row with my legs dangling off the gray blue maquette edging, but in a waiting room, surrendered under a tray of dead lights, which I shared with a Vietnam vet who didn't have any legs. He put his arm around me. Who the fuck are you, he said. I knew he didn't mean it, so I let him talk to me like that. I said I had seen him earlier, boarding at South Station, a canvas duffel in hand. I felt the need to show him I had paid attention, that I was alert, the kind of person who took stock of all the exits, his weight and height and eye color. It wasn't necessary. He only shook his head and went on and on about the pain he had in his non-legs. Isn't it a little too late for Canada, I said, 
sick of his complaints, and for a while he looked down and was quiet. Then I woke up and wandered right into this world. He was talking to me again. This time, did you hear me howling? Outside it was dark, the night, the night onto itself. I could see my reflection perfectly in the clean wall of windows, an unnecessary cruelty. Here I was to disappear. The small parking lot held a few cars, all empty. I looked for an agent, but could only make one out in the distance. It was the one from earlier, now sitting in a booth. I looked to the sky, empty and dark, then to the roadside. I didn't want to turn to the vet, to where the rest of his body used to be. Did you hear me howling? He said to my reflection. I was used to disappointing people and said, no. That's not true, he said, shaking his head. You must have been awake, awake and feeling a phantom fuck. I looked straight ahead and began planning my funeral. I did this every time I found myself like this. There were so many men and each one came with a funeral, a wooden cross, a kind of perpetuity against the brightening sky. I do not recognize the sun, the fields rising and green. Then I come too close to the edge of myself and become interested in the world and in living all over again. I don't know what was wrong with me. I was always like that, at least for a while. In the end, I glanced around, agitated, until an agent reappeared and handed me a bottle of water, which I did not drink, as if the trouble had been in the water. After several hours, I found my way onto another bus. I was less afraid now. A fellow traveler took my hand and said, this should fix it, this should fix it, and fled down the aisle. I counted the cash, $50. This was more than enough, the woman seemed to believe, for all my troubles, for whatever predicament she believed I was in. When the second bus stopped half a mile from a small college, I got off. It was morning and the sky everywhere still dark. Longfellow once called the stars forget-me-nots of angels. I don't know about that. He was a pompous fellow, not sure what came first, the pomposity or the poetry. But what did I know? I was tired and strung out and hadn't washed my hands in weeks. I had dismissed my pregnancy as bad posture. A person sees what they want to see. I watched the bus push off the curb and be erased by the night. Then the named roads carried me until I came upon a woman, whiskey glass in hand. She had been crying, I could tell, and her eyeballs were so dehydrated she could hardly keep them open. She was pretty, if that's all you looked at. Thank you, I'm gonna stop there. Thank you so much, Mari. The next reader is Yelitsa Ferreras. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for being here with us. Um, this is amazing. I am so, so grateful and honored for the generous support of the Rana Jaffe Fund Foundation. Um, this is a dream come true. Um, and I just want to say a quick hello to some of my family watching in New York. Um, my brother, Marino, my nephew, Nicholas, and my mother, Esperanza. Um, te quiero mucho, mami. Me haces mucha, mucha falta. Um, I am going to read from my novel in progress. Um, the main character is a young woman who is an aspiring artist. And um, this scene takes place in a small town in the Dominican Republic in 1989. And um, I'm just gonna jump in. The wooden house had been destroyed and rebuilt hastily after each hurricane. The foundation was greenish gray with dark mineral water marks veining the cement. Altagracia picked off, picked off a fingernail sized seashell embedded in the concrete block her family used as a front step to put on her mother's altar. They weren't so close to the ocean, but sometimes floods brought the shore to them in ripples. Her mother's altar included an image of La Virgen de la Alta Gracia, the same one in every house because she was the country's patron saint. So it was prudent to include her. 
and an image of Santo Niño de Atocha, the saint of the sick children, which had been chosen by her mother and aunts when she had survived pneumonia as a child. Her mother had rubbed herb concoctions into her gums and her family and neighbors held praying vigils. Her father had promised his own life if she survived, though he eventually left them and traded in one life for another. He was rebuilding his mistress's house, painting it lime green with turquoise trim for his other children, the ones whose ages were more or less the same as her, as her brothers and her own. So that no one really knew if it had been the other way around, if her mother was the mistress. They'd had him for the earlier part of their lives, and Altagracia supposed now the other family would have him for the remainder. Everyone had heard the rickety cart her father used to carry the discarded blocks from an unfinished house outside of town. They watched in place each one around his mistress's house. And when that first block met the last, they knew he'd be gone for a while or forever. Altagracia paused and crossed herself in front of the Santo Niño, who wore a shepherd's cape and held a basket that contained loaves of bread. And although she didn't pray to him every day, she acknowledged him whenever possible. The Santo Niño was the subject of some of her earliest drawings, often depicting him in a superhero cape, replacing the bread loaves with small animals, such as plump bunnies and big-eyed lizards. She had once asked her mother if there was a saint for artists, but she had said that it wasn't necessary, that art was for men or crazy women, that it wouldn't make sense to pray to something that was irrelevant. And Altagracia had asked, why should I keep praying to the Santo Niño for the rest of my life after I survived? Her mother told her that when you are a sickly child, it marks you, that you should spend the rest of your life being grateful for the life you were gifted by God and your saint. You do not ask for more. Today was the day that Altagracia would meet the politician and interview Socrates, one of her childhood friends who now lived in New York, had arranged for her. The commission was to create a painting of the politician for his re-election campaign poster. When Socrates had said, I'm giving you a chance to get out, Altagracia hugged him and felt the coolness of the large links of his gold chain against her collarbone, her future already fresh and unsweaty in her mind. Socrates didn't explain how he'd gotten to know the politician and she didn't ask. He said that the politician wanted something that wouldn't, that wouldn't be plastered over in the next election, a keepsake. Something that would say, the 90s is a period of change, almost the turn of the century. He wanted to be seen in a new light, though he really didn't need to be. He would win this election, just like he had won all the others, because if you had a concrete block to your name, it was his family's name that was stamped on it. All the other politicians posed for stiff pictures on vibrant backgrounds in the colors of their party and, and these aspiring or incumbent mayors, councilmen, deputies, and so on were airbrushed to the point that they all resembled smooth dolls of varying light beige shades with a few of the particularly charismatic, the darker ones sprinkled in. Their faces slowly bleaching in the sun until they were all white by election time. As you walked down the street, all those heads watched from above, competing with the eager women and virile men on pres Presidente beer signs. In preparation for the meeting, her mother had marched her down to Ippolita's beauty, beauty world, parted the curtain that separated the living room from the salon, sat her down on the chair, and told Ippolita to straighten her daughter out. Altagracia knew that if she was going to become a great artist, it wouldn't happen while she was sitting in a salon. But her mother had already borrowed the money, even though she didn't believe in this nonsense. When the electricity went out, Altagracia sat with her hair rollers drying out in the backyard, sketching on the edges of a newspaper, as she listened to the ladies talking about El Pintor, the guy that painted all the beauty salon signs in town, and who just finished a sign featuring a woman who looked exactly like one of their neighbors. El Pintor wore a plastic baby blue shower cap while he worked. There was no reason to, but he did. After he was done with a masterpiece, 
he would sit down to get his hair done, then emerge crowned in a glossy afro with a side part shaved into it, a wide tuft of hair on top, and a smaller bobble jutting out on the side. He had a monopoly on painting luscious lipped, big busted, sleek haired women and broad shouldered, mustachioed, pompadoured men, both of the Salamis unisex. He always painted a border of scissors and combs and blow dryers around their heads. That was his thing. Altagracia thought all the signs looked the same, but his style was instantly recognizable and established the owner of the salon as a serious hair professional. Using El Pintor had its advantages, but Altagracia would have to dethrone him one day. The ladies had also talked about how you couldn't trust any of the politicians and that somebody was getting rich, but it wasn't them. They wondered if the riots that had been going on in the capital would spread to these parts, like opening a fist. It was a weird time with people getting brave and throwing rocks until the military pointed guns at their faces. There was this excitement, the air charged like the electricity they were supposed to have. And while people were complaining about food prices and roadblocks, they still got their hair done. Might as well look good while you're feeling bad. Altagracia patted the alien slickness of her hair. She dabbed at a small spot on her nape that burned where Ipolita had neglected to wash off the hair straightening chemicals. Then she stepped out into the concrete blocks in front of the shack. She, st she stood in the bright midday sun waiting for her ride that would deliver her to the politician. I'll stop there, thank you. <laughs> thank you so much, Yelitsa. Our next reader is Tamim Fruchter. Hi everyone. Um, I'm so delighted and beyond grateful to be here with this incredible cohort of writers and beyond grateful to the Rona Jaffe Foundation for, um, yes, a, definitely a dream come true. Um, super excited to be here and thank you for all being here as well. Um, so I'm gonna read from the beginning of my um, novel in progress. Um, it is, it's not the exact beginning, but it's somewhere near the beginning. So all you really need to know is that the novel is situated very deeply in Jewish folklore. Um, so this is a section where um, we're kind of getting into different origin stories. And this is the origin story, part of the origin story of one of the main characters, Shiva Margolin. Um, I use the Hebrew word Hashem, which just means God. A point of origin has coordinates. For Shiva Margolin, those coordinates were Lockwood and Cedar Streets, Silver Spring, Maryland, 11th grade. A Shabbos she'd spent at her classmate Miriam's. Miriam wasn't a good friend. She was just an acquaintance. Oh, no. Not a couple of Shiva she enjoyed. They're a little weird, she said, in a good way. Shiva wasn't sure what that meant, but she was curious. They were two girls, one a raspy voice and a strong Brooklyn accent, shaved undercut underneath a more modest ponytail. The other curly hair that framed her face like a mane, a small nose with a tiny rhinestone stud on one side, big expectant eyes that looked unshy. Amy and Shosh. They didn't say it, but Shiva sensed they were together. She felt something like awe as she watched Shosh lace her fingers through Amy's when she thought no one was looking and Amy get extra cake for Shosh at dessert. Shiva didn't know exactly what she was seeing. Most Friday nights found her quiet, reading on the puffy blue couch in her living room alongside her father, her mother asleep in the armchair across the way. She was in the middle of a novel about a woman on a long solo road trip and had just finished a chapter where the woman pulls over, checks into a seaside inn, and sits topless on some salty balcony overlooking the ocean, eating a pouch of hot french fries and drinking scotch. Shiva felt something like desire reading this, some string tightening in the middle of her ribcage. She was used to feeling abstract desire, longing without any real target, but not to the specifics of want. Let's do tarot, said Shosh after Friday night dinner, everyone stuffed and in pajamas. Shiva didn't know what tarot was, but she didn't want to tear herself away from Miriam's guests, so she kept quiet about it. They sat around the coffee table after Miriam's parents and little brother had gone to bed. 
My dad would think this was like idolatry, Miriam said, giggling nervously as though she might not be so sure herself. So we should be quiet in case he comes down. Shosh says it's a way of getting at Hashem sideways, said Amy, so there's nothing wrong with it at all. It's not like a seance or anything. Hashem sideways. Yes, and besides, Shosh didn't seem too worried about the degree to which it was or wasn't like anything. She shuffled the deck, clacked it a few times on the table, and set it down. She looked at Shiva first. Her glossy chapstick cut the lamplight in Miriam's living room. Think of a question you want to ask the deck, Shosh said, any question about any part of your life. Shiva sat quietly, her panic rising. In her head, like a weird folkloric chant, the song about the four children from the Passover Seder, the wise child, the wicked child, the simple child, and the child who does not know what to ask. She was that last child. She wished she were wise or even wicked, but she was always that last one. The constant feeling that she was searching, but when pressed, she wouldn't have been able to tell you what for. Do I have to tell you the question? Shiva spoke quietly and pointedly, wanting to seem like she had a handle on tarot and on girls who held each other's hands. No, it's better if you don't. Just think about the question, shuffle the deck yourself, and then, when you're ready, draw a card. Shiva thought the word please, sent it out to no one in particular. Then, more specific, please help me find the right question. She thought for some reason about an infinite vertical line all the way up and down through the world, through the generations, through layers and layers of earth and time. She tried to conjure the shape of wanting, the actual shape of it. Plum cake came to her mind, a revelry of small black birds in a delicate loop, blue light in the snow, and then for some reason, laughter. She drew her card then, placed it face up on the coffee table. The ancestor, said Shosh, reverent, this is an amazing card. On the card, a picture of a figure with a reindeer's head striding through the woods and a pounding drum. What does it mean, Shiva felt a little scared looking at the wandering reindeer person, wondering what it might portend. In her head, she rifled through the long and intricate vocabulary of superstitions she'd grown up on, wondering whether, according to her mother, the card would be some kind of transgression or a bad sign. Shosh flipped studiously through the little tarot booklet to the corresponding page. Hmm, she said, she's a traveler. She's one with both the land and the spiritual world and can anchor you on a journey or if you're searching for the answer to a big question. She's a guide so you feel less lost because she has been everywhere already and she has also been here for a very long time. Shosh looked directly at Shiva. Is there something big you're looking for? Something that an old timer might be able to help you with? Much later, Shiva would mostly remember the orange quality of the light, how it made Shosha's curls a straw-colored cloud around her face Amy nestled in next to her. She would remember that vertical line she'd imagined, but this time it ran up and down through her body like a bolt, cross-cutting her very center. She would remember the walk they took the next day, Shosha and Amy walking ahead, she and Miriam walking behind, and the feeling she had looking at the two of them, almost like nostalgia, but they were nowhere she had ever been before. She has been everywhere already, and she has also been here for a very long time. Shiva would repeat this like a prayer before she slept for many nights that year until finally the right question began to emerge. She saw it in dreams and in waking, peeking quietly out from behind trees and signposts. And when the question finally sounded, she held it like something delicate. She took it with her to college, where her friends were all queer, but Shiva didn't date. She took it with her into her early 20s where she dated two men, one of whom broke her heart and the other whose heart broke too easily in her hand. She took it with her to her first job at a music nonprofit where she met her best friend Levi, who she learned was queer and trans and silently rolled the words queer and trans around on her tongue until she could finally say them aloud. Was there such a thing as a slow bloomer? Everything changed when she moved to New York at 25. Fast track. Levi had also moved to New York. She moved into an apartment near his. They dated, fell in brief love, broke up, fell in deeper friend love. She didn't tell her parents, but she gave them clues, gave herself clues, held the question still. She experimented with jewel tones on her face, jade eyeshadows and amber lipsticks, borrowed her new friend Yvette's femme as fuck tank top and never returned it, signed up for a workshop on Yiddish and the queer erotic, embraced smoked fish as aphrodisiac, and had a homoambiguous staring contest with the character on her daily train route who wore bright florals and one consistent dangly earring. Wore her body prouder, wore her jeans softer and her bras cuter. Walked like coffee in her hand and going somewhere. Bought lacy underwear just in case. She learned to cook. 
She wasn't a superb cook, but she baked great cakes, learned her way around a kugel, and had a killer meatball recipe, so she got by. She auditioned for a bit role in an amateur burlesque show and got it. She walked across the Brooklyn Bridge weeping, but not because she was sad. She bought a donut, she bought a dildo. She was smitten with possibility with the everyday act of walking out her front door. She had crushes. Drag king in priestly garb at the slipper room, German skater dyke at Met Metropolitan, hairdresser she met at her friend Alana's loft party, visiting sculptor at the activist art build, undercut and mesh person on the F train, person sketching tomatoes in Tompkins Square Park, person working the bar at Ginger's, person hogging the pool table at Ginger's, person on the sidewalk screaming, that doesn't make it a rainbow into their flip phone, person wearing homemade wings on the street, person through the frosty window in the meat packing district in winter, she got a new job at an organization that gave grants to filmmakers and moved to Smith and Ninth Streets in Brooklyn, a little apartment whose front windows kissed the Brooklyn Queens Expressway so it rattled when the cars passed. She shared the apartment with three roommates she'd never met, depositing her toothbrush into a cup that already bore theirs. She rounded the corner to 28. This was the year her father got diagnosed with cancer and things went quickly here too. Her mother already in a deep blend of mourning and denial and Shiva reliant on queer New York's ungodly speeds to keep her from falling into the depths of sadness she knew the occasion required. She surrendered wholeheartedly to the rush of it and in the rush of it, she tagged along with her roommate Salma to the party where she met Danny. It was Danny's housemate's birthday party so Danny was the one mixing the drinks. We're doing boulevardiers and French 75s, she said, not looking up from her shaker. She was tall, focused. There's also beer in the fridge. Can I make you something? She finished shaking and poured, then looked up. She looked like early party adrenaline, a light sheen and brown eyes under eyebrows that were permanently raised. Her dark curls were fat, but her hair was short, which made for a very fetching helmet. I've never had a boulevardier, said Shiva, suddenly aware of the low cut of her tank top. Well, allow me to make you your first, said Danny. You won't regret it. Danny could say things like this somehow. This was already clear. Her smile, wide and elastic, filled her face. Later, Shiva came back for a second boulevardier. I told you, said Danny. Later, Danny stopped bartending, slouched onto the antique couch, unbuttoned the top two buttons of her shirt, cracked open a beer can. Tough day at the office, huh? Shiva's two boulevardiers had made her bold. Later, Shiva and Danny still on the couch talking about snow. Danny had grown up in California, snow still novel. We should probably trade numbers, said Danny. If it snows this winter, you can take me sledding. Show me how it's done. Later, Shiva would finally curb the subtle trembling in her wrists and knees. Later, she would realize she was the last person at the party. Thank you all. Thank you so much, Tamim. The next reader is Elisa Gonzalez. Um, hi, everyone. I am marking your transition from prose to poetry this evening. Um, or, yes, poetry. Oh my God, I'm so nervous. Um, <laughs> thank you, everyone. Thank you to the Rona Jaffe Foundation and to NYU for hosting this. Um, and to my family, who I was instructed to shout out in a text message. So I have to do that. Um, this first poem is called Current Wonders, and it's a list of bewilderment. That morning light from two large uncurtained windows doesn't correct. My sleepy eyes, they stay small, stupid, and grumpy. That nonetheless, the rest of me moves. That it's accident, but the light and I touch my desk at the same time. That the light doesn't have hands, it seems like it should, it draws shapes like hands do. That I'm not dreaming, because in dreams I can never talk, and today my mouth is so dry, I try infant sounds for elemental needs, law for water, etc. That suffering is often speechless, sometimes soundless, and yet we understand it exists in the absence, too. And yet, have I ever not been shocked at pain, like a toddler falling down? That my fingers miss the keys, that there's no hefty Victorian monument built in lyric, nor an elegy for the ongoing. When elegy travels from lament to solace, 
to return us from grief to life to free us from the dead. Not yet, not yet. To honor suffering when honor puts gravestones where no body is, hides bodies where no gravestones are. Well, I can't. That I used to speak as a whole being without doubt, or do I misremember? That I am angry though powerless, like a child. Well, today I am a child. And with a child's voice deepened by some form of progress, I ask for water. The same cadence, the same intonations, insistent and afraid, because all lack in childhood feels like it will last forever. A fever thirst, a mother leaving for her job at the grocery store, a door locked to keep you safe, small fists against the cold door. That they didn't break it down, that they bled, that they hurt only later and now, not in a dream, but in silence. A pain like light against a wall or just against. This next poem is also um, negotiating childhood, called Failed Essay on Privilege. I came from something popularly known as nothing, and in the coming, I got a lot. My parents didn't speak money, didn't speak college, still I went to Yale. For a while, I tried to condemn. I wrote, let me introduce you to evil. Still, I was a guest there. I made myself at home. And I know a fine shoe when I see one. And I know to be sincerely sorry for those people's problems. I know to want nothing more than it would be so nice to have. And I confess I'll never hate what I've been given as much as I wish I could. Still, I thought I of all people understood Aristotle, what is and isn't the good life, because I wrote privilege is an aggressive form of amnesia. I left a house with no heat. I left the habit of hunger. I left a room I shared with seven brothers and sisters I also left. Even the good is regrettable, or at least sometimes should be regretted. Yet to hate myself is not to absolve her. I paid so much for wisdom, and look at all of this. Look at all I have. This poem um, that I'm about to read moves <laughs> wildly forward in time. I wrote it in late March um, during the lockdown in New York City. In quarantine, I reflect on the death of Ophelia. I wake early and angry. I eat oatmeal with thyme honey. I call my sister, I call my mother, I call my other sisters, my brothers. I worry about my feverish lover. I worry about my siblings, jobless now. I send an ill-advised email. I don't send an ill-advised tweet. I'm alone, so I'm lonely. That's what my sister says. Time to stay indoors, the doctor says, all the doctors say. But the open window betrays that not everyone's voice dies to solitude. Shut up, shut up, the window slams. Time to embrace the virtues of boredom, the price of happiness again after. The window shows men digging a place for survivors of the future, the rich ones. It will be a condo tower, glass walls for better envy. They've built the frames I see around the holes where doors will someday go. Capitalism, so full of holes and hope. If I try to remember what it was like, childhood, a period of kudzu growth that felt like stasis in the white glazed room where days upon days my father shut me. If I try, I see the ceiling, that water stain trailing down like brown pre raphaelite curls hair of a drowning girl among the reeds, which later I recognized in a painting of a pale drowning Ophelia. I love alone, I tell my sister. She says, you just want to. I agree I want the past, for a magnolia to bloom on a crowded street, all safe in beauty, for I still love the world, though it drowns and dies like that girl avoidably. A professor once asked, 
pleased we wouldn't know, who is really responsible for the death of Ophelia? The answer, he said, ought to feel like we have arrived together at a skyscraper's peak, where the inhuman view reveals in windows and in streets the small, thick, or potentially thick bodies, each one a new array of questions. The only possible epiphany is that the ending of a thought is never such. Together, I liked the word in the professor's mouth. But if I am alone, and if I am lonely, and if I am not alone in loneliness, and if the everyone together suffers, and if this everyone suffers and dies by the unguided motion of matter, and if also by the motion of self-guided men, and if also by the motion of money, and if, of course, you are always going to die, Ophelia, and if even so, your death remains unforgivable, then what are the questions I should ask? All I have is sleeplessness and rage, and that's no answer. That's not even a thought, though it might not end till my body does, perhaps not even then, as I can imagine it going on past my ending, and really, what more suitable ghost could I leave behind? And I do love the world. Um, this last poem is very short. Um, and if I have an Ars Poetica, it's probably this question, um, which I think is an ethical and an aesthetic one if they can be separated. A question of art. If a great poet is like a steady-handed dentist, you must extract gracefully, confidently, sure that you are pulling the right small, vulnerable object into the light. Ignore the blood, but whose is the mouth? Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Elisa. Our next and final reader is Charlene McClure. Hello everyone, um, I hope you can hear me okay. I can speak up, I have a teacher voice, <laughs> so I can, I can speak up some. Um, so I guess this is real, this is actually happening right now. Um, I've been reflecting and I just, you know, I think a lot of my poems happen in the lyric, in this dream space where I get to question and revise um, how we see ourselves and question and revise how we name ourselves and, and how we love ourselves. And I felt lucky that I found a few people in my life who understood that. Um, and you know, some of them even conspire with me in dreaming up um, new worlds and new ways of seeing. And I, <laughs> I just, um, floored by this and I just thank Rona Jaffe for for showing me understanding um, that they understand my work and what it's pointing to. Um, so I'm going to read a poem I actually wrote this week. Um, so um, and we were talking and a lot of a lot of the other recipients were just um, talking about reading newer work. So here we go. Brand new poem <laughs> up for workshop tomorrow actually. So here <laughs> we'll see. Um, this is for the revolution and for the unnamed. Defund the police, abolish ICE, arrest Breonna Taylor's murderers. Insurrection, sonnet number four. Someone called you out your name and now you are undone. A tragedy of history, a ledger, a pen, what else? Or so the story goes. Who is to say? Without your name, you weren't given another set of instructions. Who's to say with control? You didn't all drown the slavers, slit their wrists with shackles and shame. The slavers who as they walked the deck didn't know the depths of sea beneath them, the species under where only the dark and its descendants move through the murky water. They were created in the kingdom of Eden, and even they have not been named. Um, this next poem is for um, the wild and wondrous body. 
I bleed and stain the sheets. The halo's crooked crimson, its circle slick beneath me. No, I don't wear it like an angel. I ride it like a horse. Blood is the saddle and I'm strapped in its animal, its mud, its hooves and red clay, the color of my awakening. Have I crossed a line? Maybe, but it was in me all along, waiting in the silhouette of sleep, the scent of his hibiscus, where I was an open window, where I was the rain's bank, bioluminous and half liquid myself, unbound. This ink outside my knowledge, this ink on the bed, making a constellation of dark stars that weren't beaten out. Um, I, I'm just going to read uh, one more poem. Um, but before I read this last poem, I, I just wanted to take a moment to also just congratulate all the other awardees. Um, you're wonderful and talented and I'm so honored to to be able to have my name spoken alongside yours. Um, and I thank you for your work. Um, I read this last poem also for nurse Don Wooten who exposed the violence being done in ICE detention centers. I read this for my many, many sisters who are here. <laughs> and I read this for my sweet, sweet mommy. <laughs> who left her body a year ago, <laughs> but also left her love for me in this world. <laughs> this is for her and for her sisters too. <sighs> My sisters are a circle after Claudia Rankin. She is unclosed, a parenthesis at the beginning, a Sisyphus, a Genesis, an ellipsis, unending. As girls, knowing our youth would end at the fence, we faced each other, my palm a pulse against hers. We played a game where I reached for her, where I rushed to catch a hand, to catch a sister. We began this way braided to the scalp, the sound clapping happening between us, slow to part. When the last minute approached, when in our nation the blood arrived, we were slow to part, no longer clapping, our hands were clasped. Mercy, my sister's mercy opening the windows in the house. She heard me weeping above my mother's grave, mercy, what has been done to her in mudstone and graphite recorded, savored unuttered in the mouths of others, a moan in paper gowns down long hallways, in the chorus of her bones, what has been done to her, my sister, as painful as diamonds, as clear as the water used to be, mercy. Not all my sisters were born daughters, but all my sisters have been through it, up in it, ordered and arranged in and out of its falling. The doctor said, the president, he did it, he did it, and he do. Sis, we are the same letter curving into herself. The serpent in the garden was not how he tells it, a con, sis, but our accomplice, not a sinner, but the same letter sheltering a singular I between us, S-I-S -S for the S-O-S. -S. She sings with her hair tightening in the rain. Where her last lover withers, pour oil. Let the rumors about her body, not her body, disappear. Washed away in the rivers, water, spilling out of her, the rivers, the rivers course inside of her. She is a map of names. She's pulled out herself. Have her return. Thank you all. Thank you all so much. 
for your words, for sharing your work with our community. We need writers like you. We need words like yours, all of you, more than ever. Um, and I'm just wanted to say one more, you know, big congratulations from me and from everyone at NYU um, for being here. We all look forward to seeing more of your work, which I know we will um, in readings and on the page in the future. Um, I'm going to unmute, I'm going to allow, I'm going to let you unmute yourselves, excuse me, um, the whole audience um, in a minute to clap as loud and yell as loud and cry as loud or laugh as loud as you want. And um, like I said, after that, I'll be um, putting the links to each, each writer's um, reception in the chat in case you want to join those as well. And I, I do encourage you to do so, to say hello and, um, you know, let them know how much you appreciated their readings. Um, so go for it. Yeah, Charlene. Charlene, we love you. Charlene. Amazing, Charlene. Amazing. Yeah, good job, Alisa. Woo! Great job. Incredible, Charlene. Woo! Woo! Charlene. <laughs> All right, sorry, here we go. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs>